Good morning, and welcome to Group 2's talk on data and surrealism. This is Tom McMillan Oakley coming to you from Jackson, Michigan. It's another cold and snowy week here in the Mitten, so let's take our minds off the weather and dive into the pool with Dali and the other surrealists. I'd like to thank my group, Gary, Kate, and Mary. We've put a lot of work into this presentation, and we hope you enjoy it. Dr. Choi challenged us with this prompt, and we feel that our presentation hits on the points outlined by the professor. There is much to unpack with this rather brief time period, so let's get started. It's important to remember that much of this artwork was generated during the time between the world wars, and this movement reflects the chaos of the time and the need to flee both mentally and physically from reality. The movement is also deeply steeped in the writings of Freud and his work with the unconscious, and how that can materialize in the work and the process used to create the work. Since we only have about 20 minutes, we're going to focus on the artists and the artwork and leave the deep dive into psychology and, psychoanal and psychoanalysis for another time. If you haven't already, Art 565 spends a great deal of time on the subject matter. Dr. Yao does a great job of getting everybody involved and helping you understanding a bit more. The origin of the name Dada is unclear. Some believe that it is a nonsensical word. This may sound familiar to you if you like pop music and are a fan of Lady Gaga. Much of her shenanigans and antics are based on the Dadaist and Surrealist. Remember the infamous meat suit and the arrival of the, at the award show in the egg? That's straight out of the Dali playbook. In accordance with the Dada ideal, the movement would not be called Dadaism, much less designated an art movement. Mary provided this definition from the Tate Museums in the UK. Dada was an art movement formed during the First World War in Zurich in negative reaction to the horrors and follies of war. Dada work was usually extremely sarcastic, satirical, and usually mocking something altogether. Dadaism began in 1916 when artists of the movement decided to eradicate traditional values in art and create a new sort of art quite different from the past. Dada was not only anti-war, but also anti-bourgeois, and against many political associations. Artist Hans Arp once wrote, Revolted by the butchery of the 1914 World War, we in Zurich devoted ourselves to the arts. While the guns rumbled in the distance, we sang, painted, made collages, and wrote poems with all of our might. The founder of Dada was writer Ugo Ball, but the leading artists were Marcel Duchamp, Francis Picabia, and Kurt Schwitters. We'll focus our talk on Arp and Duchamp. Arp's works were usually non-representational, but deeply organic in nature. He was very diverse in his media and used a variety of materials for his sculptures. Breaking with a long-standing tradition of rigor and planning out compositions in advance, Arp embraced chaos and chance and allowed pieces to flow, fle flow freely, Excuse me, oftentimes being created purely by dropping scraps of paper onto another piece of paper and allowing gravity and chance to do that work. Arp did not begin with a subject in mind. He created the work first and then named it. This allowed him to eschew the conscious mind and allow pure creation to happen. Arp's biomorphic sculptures resemble discarded chewing gum or melted wax, but they are hardy sculptures made of wood, metals, and stone. Arp is a bridge of sorts, offering us a transition from the remnants of Cubism to Dadaism, and then straight on into Surrealism. Marcel Janco. Romanian artist um, Marcel Janco was a visual artist, architect, and art theorist. He was a co-founder of Dada. Janco eventually abandoned the anti-art of Dada, finding it somewhat negative, and began to embrace constructivism. Cabaret Voltaire, from 1916, by Janco, is one of the important artworks that clearly shows the Dada artist. In this overcrowded canvas, you will find musicians, spectators, and other inanimate objects. 
there's a wide variety, a wide range of emotions and activities erupting into little distinction among all. This piece is nearly a sensory overload of sights, sounds, and cabaret anarchy. So now we move on to Marcel Duchamp, the great prankster of the art world. In 1913, the unsuspecting public in New York City witnessed the birth of modernism at the Armory Show. The collection, a mix of American and European artists, astounded the 4,000 attendees and challenged their notions of what was considered beautiful and what ultimately made something art. As you can see by the flyer for this event, all walks of artistic stances were represented in the show, from the neoclassical with David and Angre to the post-impressionist. There was something for everybody. The show was a sensation for sure, and people lined up around the block to get in and witness the craziness that was unleashed by Duchamp. The public had seen nudes before in many of the galleries and museums that fill the metropolis in New York, but this was something they were having a hard time relating to. The colors, the form, the name, what was it? It was this, Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, and it caused a stir. Everything, everything the public had known about art was shattered, and the figure created by Duchamp in the painting appeared to be shattered as well. In the 100 uh, Jacobus text, they discuss how Duchamp is showing a rather dystopian view of the futurist world, where man is overcome and dominated by the infernal machine. The show was a self-funded show, so the rules were thrown out the door as the artists were beholden only to themselves with their curatorial choices. The critics had a field day with the work and lampooned it, lampooned it in the press and in reviews. What they didn't know is that this was a fuse that was ignited that ignited the new art world, a world where Einstein was studying our universe at a level that had never been considered before. Buildings were going up around the city, creating the distinctive skyline we know today. And the effects of this silliness are still seen today in Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. I'll give you a second to read this one. Um, this is actually in my lecture uh, for my art history classes here at the college, and my students absolutely love this. And if they don't know Watterson, they're introduced to this very imaginative young man. And then this one. As a parent of a very energetic and not shy nine-year-old boy, this um, is something that happens to me on a regular basis. So, yeah, Calvin, quite the little artist. And on the 100th anniversary of the show, an artist created this 3D representation of the work and placed it on the steps of the armory. I think this is absolutely fantastic. But in exploring and exploding the art world, Duchamp began mating, making his ready-mades, the art pieces that took the prosaic and mundane from everyday life and repurposed it into a new and slightly altered way. Here a postcard of the Mona Lisa is now a hirsute version of the Renaissance beauty. The object trove or found object is L-H-O-O-Q, which is a pun. The letters pronounced in French sound like El Achad Akul, which means she is hot in the arse. In a late interview, Duchamp gives a loose translation of L-H-O-O-Q as, There is a fire down below. But the ready-mades went beyond a corrupted postcard to reimagining everyday items in a different light. Here a bottle dryer becomes a scary sculpture when removed from its utilitarian function. Hunter and Jacobus discuss how by designating these items art, Duchamp challenged the established hierarchy of what is considered art and how we view it. This art intervention paved the way for Yoko Ono's instructions for paintings in the 60s, where she wrote in fixed verse ideas and steps for paintings that may or may not ever exist. The challenge to what was status quo was, according to Hunter and Jacobus, very disconcerting. His most famous, or dare I say infamous, ready-made was Fountain, a standard-issue urinal tipped on its side and signed R. Mutt, 1917. 
The original work was rejected for display, and a photo by the piece by Alfred Stieglitz is what brought fame and notoriety to Duchamp in his work. The original does not exist, however, there are 16 Duchamp-approved replicas in collections around the world. And here is the one at the San Francisco MoMA collection. I had a chance to see this back in 2008. Here we have his assisted ready-made bicycle wheel in the collection at MoMA in New York City. Duchamp attached the bike wheel to the stool so he could watch it spin and turn. The term assisted ready-made comes from the manipulation of Duchamp in combining two distinct and different objects into something new. And sometimes the parody becomes parodied in the most delightful way. One of my students, after watching the lecture on Duchamp, sent me this image that they found on the internet, and I think it's quite fitting and quite funny. Here we have Duchamp's art medal at the University of Michigan's Art Museum in Ann Arbor. Duchamp challenged the notion of art and commerce by casting an art medal out of silver, fashioning it after a sink stopper. From the UMMA's website, they say, This is a sink stopper that Duchamp first designed by hand for his bathroom in Cadicus, Spain. This everyday handmade object was then reproduced in a series of 100. The piece demonstrated the meeting of art objects and the mundane. It is also an example of ironic commercialization and artist self-representation. The International Pneumostatic Agency later released an edition of 300 as a collector's item the Duchamp art metal. So by using precious metals and ordinary things, he's messing with us and our ideas of what is art and what is indeed important. And by the way, the pipe with the glass bubble is also a Duchamp piece as well, um, but there was very little information on it. So you can just look at it and come to Ann Arbor and see it for yourself. And once again, the internet, um, <clears throat> excuse me, plays with our perception. One of my students sent me this as well, so enjoy. Let's move on to the Surrealists. In 1924, artist and poet André Bretons published his Surrealist Manifesto and released the first edition of the Surrealist Review, La Révolution Surrealiste. This cultural movement was an expression of the psychic automatism and the omnipotence of dream. Surrealism questioned the fundamentals, fundamentals of artistic creation, moving away from reason and rationality, and granted permission for artists to use imagination and creative license. The main goal of the manifesto is to free one's mind from the past and from everyday reality to arrive at truths one has never known. Also at this time, other artists around the world were writing additional manifestos and beginning to demonstrate surrealist techniques in their work. As a side note, this is when most of my students in my art history classes at Jackson College sit up and take notice, especially my incarcerated students. After my lecture at Dali, one of my students at the Cotton Correctional Facility slapped his desk and he got up. Now this is what I'm talking about, Tom. This art speaks to me. And for sure, the Surrealists remain very popular. André Masson developed automatism as he painted with abstract calligraphy, swift lines, and cursive-like brushstrokes. Some of his most inventive works, he used tube pigment mixed with sand, which he randomly poured over the canvas. There is violence in his work, perhaps stemming from his war injuries, that could be seen in his Battle of the Fishes, which, is, which in our hunter reading states displays powerful analogs of human passion, and profound belief in the symbolic unity of all things. Juan Moreau, considered by Breton as the most surrealist of us all, originally refused to be recognized in the school of surrealism. He was later carried away by their new ideals of their new ideas and poetry. He used automatism to free his paintings from cubism, embrace the formal side of surrealism, and his hyperactive principle of analogy. He began drawing almost entirely from hallucinations, infusing fantasy and childhood memories from nature. Like Masson, he used free, flowing, cursive-like lines in his paintings, The Hunter, and incorporates familiar scenes from his farm in Montreuil. This is the first Moreau that I ever saw, and it is at the Toledo Museum of Art in Toledo, Ohio. When you look at this initially untitled, 
titled piece of art, you see a rather nightmarish image emerging from the canvas. Ironically, this piece was created for a nursery. From the TMA's website comes this rather convoluted description of the work. And I quote, on the back of this canvas is the, dedica is the dedication Poor Jackie, Peter et Pali Matisse, the names of the three sons of Moreau's dealer, Pierre Matisse, son of artist Henri Matisse. It was originally displayed in their nursery, despite its nightmarish imagery. Therefore, for many years, this painting was exhibited as nursery decoration. When Moreau saw the painting again in New York in 1959, he revealed its true and real title. Woman Haunted by the Passage of the Bird, Dragonfly, Omen of Bad News. This work was painted after the signing of the Munich Agreement, in which European leaders attempted to appease Adolf Hitler and avoid the, art, the outbreak of World War II from 1939 to 1945. Moreau has graphically illustrated the pervading sense of conflict and confusion. And this is from the Tulia Museum of Arts Facebook page, and this was their Art of the Week a while ago. Now we move on to Max Ernst, who was a German painter, sculptor, poet, and graphic artist. However, he is best known for his contribution to the Dada movement and surrealism. In 1919, Ernst and social activist Johannes the Theodor Bergeld, along with several colleagues, founded the Cologne Dada Group. Ernst used a mixture of mediums, paintings, collages, sculptures, printmaking, and drawing. After serving in World War I for four years, Ernst began producing his first collages along other Dadaists of the time. Eventually, he replaced these with more complicated image metaphors. In these, work, in these works, excuse me, he used mechanically reproduced fragments, such as the image of chemical bombs being re released from a plane. Ernst is most known for the surrealist for the surrealist period in the 1920s, an artistic and literary movement that praised irrationality over order and reason. He continued to make work that reflected the horror and epitome of war, as he still contemplated the trauma of his experience in World War I. His use of collage continued to show in his work, as he stated this was one that this was the culture of systematic displacement. Ernst used a technique called frottage, meaning to rub, seen in his natural history drawings. He added texture by rubbing objects on sheets of paper, resulting in spontaneous, surf spontaneous surface markings and hallucinatory textures. Later, he experimented with decalcomania, a technique that involves pressing paint between sheets of paper, removing the mind as much as possible from the act of creating art. After fleeing Europe due to World War II, Ernst, lives in Ernst lived in exile in the United States. He created the Eye of Silence after traveling around the American West. The painting does not depict an actual place, but a fantasy world with grottos, stalactites, and stalagmites, and rock formation containing circular forms resembling eyes. These otherworldly elements alluded to the destruction of Europe can also be seen to illuminate surrealist ideas about dreams acting as pathways to the mind and the exploration of emotions stored in memory and the unconscious. So now we move on to Salvador Dali, and no talk on surrealism would be complete without a mention of him. Dali was a Spanish painter who was prominently known for his con contributions to surrealism. It is known to be one of the most famous painters in modern art. Dali was extremely imaginative, unusual, and indulged in theatrical and flamboyant behavior. Remember what I said about Lady Gaga and the egg and the meat suit? Uh, I think she got it from him. The sometimes created more attention than his works of art, however, it is believed to be that one of the reasons why he gained so much fame. There's no such thing as bad publicity. When Dali came to Paris to join up with the Surrealists in the 20s, he brought with him a lifetime full of obsessions and phobias, including a distinct fear of running the Metro. But here we have a photo, uncredited, from 1969, showing Dali emerging from the Metro with an anteater. First of all, where do you get an anteater? Um, in 1930, Dali created a book plate for André Breton called André Breton, Le Temenois, that translate to André Breton, the anteater the nickname given to him by his fellow Surrealist. 
In the photo, it is several years after Breton's passing. Perhaps, in Dali's own way, this is a tribute. Nothing Dali did was ever ordinary. Nothing. Just look at this amazing photo from 1948 well before Photoshop and other computer aids for photos. This is a tour de force that captures the brewing insanity that is Dali and his work. We posted a link to a for in the forum that takes a deeper dive into what went on into creating this image. Please take a moment and check it out. It's well worth your time. And here we have um, the same collaboration uh, with the the photographer from the previous photo, um, and this is Envelope de Amores, or The Voluptuous Death, a photo taken in 1951. Um, Dali seems to be quite unaware of the macabre scene going on behind him with the various models. And if you are a fan of scary movies, you may remember this image from the movie poster for Silence of the Lambs. The skull is part of the death head moth, an insect that has a similar marking on its thorax. But when enlarged, you notice that it is indeed the same photo, but superimposed. The persistence of memory is perhaps Dali's most iconic work, a dreamlike landscape where nothing is as what it seems. Time is literally melting away, and the clocks and other timepieces that populate this space seem to be limp pancakes. An unidentifiable lump of flesh supports a pocket watch that appears to be decomposing. Ironically, one of Dali's other phobias was insects, and here we see them crawling over the back of the watch on the left. Like Duchamp, Dali is ripe for parodying as well. Matt Groening's The Simpsons did their take on the masterpiece in one of their opening couch gags. In a display of rationality, Lisa Simpson, the stern and grounded sister, younger sister to Bart, appears to be the only normal one of the family in the composition. Aside from painting, Dali also turned to sculpture, printmaking, fashion, advertising, writing, and even filmmaking collaborations, which we'll get to in a little bit. In his, painting during, in his paintings during the Surrealist movement, Dali was known to obsess with having themes of death, eroticism, and decay in his work. This reflected on his ideas and theory of the time. Dali drew on many autobiographical themes in which he interpreted with symbolism in order to create works of art that may seem confusing at first until they are fully critiqued. Dali believed that life was the greatest form of art, and because of that, he worked on each painting with so much passion, understanding, enthusiasm, because he believed that what he owed, that's what he owed to his work. He not only evolved the concepts of surrealism, but he wanted to turn the eternal to the external. He wanted people to embrace both the inside and the outside, their bodies, mind, souls, lives, and all of humanity. Dali, unlike Ernst, realized his unconscious hallucinations with the utmost reality and artisanship. Dali's brushwork and technique with the medium are exquisite to behold, even if their subject matter is a bit offsetting. In this horrific piece, Dali, along with his contemporaries, addressed the ongoing military conflicts in the world, the visage of war. Now take a minute and look at how within the eyes, the face is reconstructed, and with those eyes it's reconstructed, and it keeps going and going and going. This is known as the Drost effect. And the, the Visage of War employs this, um, named after uh, a Dutch cocoa powder, where the label is re reproduced and reproduced and reproduced into infinity. In art, this is known as mise en abim, the effect of a picture recursively appearing within itself in a place where a similar picture would realistically be expected to appear. Un chien andalou. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch the film Dr. Choi linked to us in the assignments. Un Chien Andalou, or the Andalusian Dogs, is neither about Andalusia, and there isn't a dog anywhere in the film. Turner Classic Movies has this best explanation for the film's genesis. To quote, 
Like other surrealist work, Wenxian Andalu was inspired by the world of dreams. Asked how the film originated, Buñuel recalled a conversation with Dali in 1928, where they decided to make a film together. Dali said, last night I dreamed about ants swarming on my hands. Buñuel replied, well, I dreamed that I sliced someone's eye open. With those key images settled, they wrote the entire script in six days, according to Buñuel, systematically rejecting anything that emerged from our culture or education. This film continues to shock and confound its viewers. Film critic Roger Ebert called the film one of the best short films ever made. In the end, the film, like the 1990s sitcom Seinfeld, is a movie about nothing and perhaps everything at the same time. Dali was deeply religious, and the body of his work reflects this with stories from the Bible and the life of Christ. The paranoia and craziness is put on hold for these deeply reflective and reverent images. But these are not your typical traditional images, mind you. Dali puts his own take on the canon and creates images that are both familiar, but yet foreign. Here, Christ is crucified on the cross. Or is he? The corpus is spread out in the cruciform shape, but nothing appears to be holding the body to this highly stylized cross. The body is floating above the cross with four cubes laid out squarely over the body. The body is incorrupt and free of scars from nails, flagellations, and the crown of thorns. And here we see a photo I took of it in New York City at the Met. Kate brings up a great pastime that this group did. Surrealist artists played a collaborative parlor game that yielded mixed results called Exquisite Corpse. This initially started with a word or a phrase written on a piece of paper that was then folded before the next player could add a phrase. Eventually, they began drawing or pasting images down a sheet of paper and folding it before the next element was added. These exercises exercises resulted in humorous and absurd combinations, creating a perfect game to disrupt one's conscious and spark unpredictability. Many of these ephemeral creations were done quickly on cheap paper or tablecloths. They are a curatorial preservation curatorial and preservation nightmare. The ones that I have seen on display in Chicago at the Art Institute are held in a gallery with very dim lights to preserve the antics for yet another generation. René Magritte created tension in his works between nature and artifice, truth and fiction, reality and surreality. His work was at times violent and disturbing, perhaps psychologically influenced by the trauma of his young mother's death. He explored the connection of language and visual representation, misnaming objects, using repetition, and tricks on the eye and mind. His masterpiece, The Treachery of Images, is a paradox and illustrates this play between words and images. The painting is not a pipe, but rather an image of one. Many surrealists used the motif of eyes in their art in an invitation to look at the world differently. Magritte replaces the iris with a cloud-filled blue sky and false mirror. Magritte used this magical realism to create a juxtaposition of unrelated images characteristically used by surrealists, creating bizarre combinations meant to take the viewer, viewers uneasy, excuse me, meant to make the viewers uneasy and question their reality. Is the eye looking up at the sky, or is this an opening into another dimension? In La Colère, Voyance is a self-portrait of René Magritte, and true to his style, there is much going, there is much more going on than what meets the eye. The title alone boasts of his ability to see beyond normal sensory contact. Using an unhatched egg as his reference, he paints the image of a bird, boldly predicting his, sorry future, his soaring future through his artwork. And now we move on to one of my favorites, Frida Kahlo, a deeply political and symbolic Mexican artist greatly impressed by the surrealist. Fiercely independent, she did not allow herself to be influenced by art trends. Sharing an apartment with André Breton during an extended stay in Paris, the Pope of Surrealism invited her to exhibit her work. Breton wrote, in her most recent work, is the purest expression of surrealism, although she re she produced it with no knowledge of the ideas that guided me and my friends in our work. Her muralist husband, Diego Rivera, encouraged her to paint from life if she could not find any other subject. 
In her 1932 self-portrait, Henry Ford Hospital, her, emotional, her emotions hemorrhage after her second miscarriage. Realistic and surrealistic components of a fetus, flower, uterus, pelvis, and snail, all interconnected by veins, float around her naked body. As a side note from me, the show Diego and Frida in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Arts several years ago was just a blockbuster. It documented their time in Detroit while Diego was working on the Rivera Courtyard at the DIA, and this painting um, was something to behold in purpose. It's or in, in person. It's very disturbing for sure, but it's extremely personal and very, very, very emotional. Kahlo's painting, sometimes called What the Water Gave Me, is one of her most authentic surrealist works. References to her life events swirl about her feet, a collection of plants, people, and the dress from memory and animals appear to come from, fantastic, from a fantastical vision. Frida acknowledged that her painting related to surrealist work, but was adamant that it was, no, was never her intention to fit into that category, quote unquote. As one who believed that you should take advantage of anything life offers, she did participate in the 1940 International Surrealist Exhibition in Mexico City. Frida's life was plagued with emotional and physical pain, and she suffered terribly after her divorce with Diego Rivera. Her most famous paintings, The Two Fridas, frames her two different personalities, her heart exposed in both, one dressed in traditional Tehuian costume and the other in modern dress. They are connected by holding hands and a vein that stretches between them. Her desperation and loneliness is portrayed in the dark storm clouds, dark storm clouds surrounding her inner angst. Frida Kahlo passionately painted in, in a way to be understood by her people. Originating from her consciousness, she painted her beliefs as a political, radical, and passionate nationalist. These were made accessible through her personal themes of suffering and pain. Forever scarred by a severe bus accident, she often wore orthopedic supports. In the broken column, Kahlo's body and pain are held together by a corset. A broken column represents her spine and nails piercing her flesh, representing her reality of endless pain. So another aspect of surrealism is photography. Photography was an, an easy-to-use medium that surrealist artists such as Man Ray, Magritte, and Maurice Tabard used to create uncanny images. The medium was, ex was explored using techniques such as double exposure, solarization, and distortion to create bizarre images. Man Ray met friends French artist Marcel Duchamp in 1915 and helped to form the New York group of Dada artists. In 1921, Ray became associated with the Parisian Dada and Surrealist circles of artists and writers. He experimented with photography, including rediscovering how to make cameraless pictures, which he called Rayographs. Man Ray was fascinated by juxtapositioning objects with the female body. Les Violines de Angre, the violin of Angre, is one of Man Ray's most important works. It pose, he poses his model wearing a turban. By painting sound holes on her back, he transformed the female body into a musical instrument, this converting the animated being into an inanimate, inanimate object. In Man Ray's photographed dust breeding from 1924, a large piece of glass is photographed using a long two hour exposure after it had collected a year's worth of dust. The photograph captures a complex texture and diversity of materials that lay atop the glass surface. Without a camera, Man Ray made his rayographs by placing objects such as the thumbtacks, coil of wire, and other objects directly onto a sheet of photosensitized paper and exposing it to light. This provided an abstract new way of seeing to create dreamlike visions, but through photography without a camera. Maurice Tabard is another notable surrealist photographer. His use of photography techniques such as solarization and double exposures create photographic images that require further inspection. 
<coughs> excuse me, he began his work as a portrait, fashion, and advertising photographer while experimenting with surrealist images in his personal work. This one is spectacular. Before we end, we're going to revisit Picasso and see how he got involved with this movement. In the 1930s, Picasso mingled with the surrealist thinkers and poets. He consciously picked and experimented with elements from the movement, taking part in the surrealist exhibition and trying his hand at poetry. In 1933, he sketched a series of drawings called An, an Anatomy. These, com these comprised of figures vaguely resembling human forms. Disregarding proportion, he used organic and machine-like features that possess a human-like quality. The enormous painting Guernica perhaps displays a surrealist influence the best. Picasso created the piece for the Paris World's Fair to publicly demonstrate his anger against the war, challenging the idea of heroism. It is hard to make sense of all that is going on. The layered images leave an impression of chaos, death, and destruction. Distorted faces and abnormal human features are scattered throughout the large canvas. The surrealists took to the canvas to help understand the horrors that were going on in the world around them. These images both shock us and give us light into the great artistic minds of the time. Their images are timeless and continue to open up dialogues about what it means to be human and live in this crazy world. We hope you enjoyed our presentation on Dada and Surrealism. It's important to remember that much of this artwork was generated during the time between the world wars, and this movement reflects the chaos of the time and the need to flee both mentally and physically from reality. This movement is also deeply steeped in the writing of Freud and his work on the unconscious and how they can materialize in the work and the process used to create the work. And here we have our Works Cited page. Thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to your comments.